Welcome back to chapter four. Continued is part two. We've made it through the first five. Uh, now we're going to talk about properties of substances, physical changes, chemical changes, conservation of mass, learn how to solve problems. Now we're going to pick up and learn about energy, heat, uh, energies and chemical changes, and then conservation of energy, which will be strikingly similar to conservation of mass, and also where energy uses and how it works in the real world. So let's take a look at energy. Energy is defined as the capacity to do work. And so when you look at energy, we have two big families of energy, two big categories of energy, and then a whole bunch of different kinds of types of energy. And so when we take a look at the first main type of energy, it's called potential energy. It's the energy that's stored, the energy that's due to position. When you have a book up on a shelf, it has potential energy. It can fall down. You're storing energy by it moving its position. You have a rock on the top of a mountain. You give it a push, it can roll down because it has potential energy. It has stored energy. And so sometimes we talk about chemistry, you talk about chemical energy is stored energy basically have that energy in the molecule stored and it can then come out and so it's the energy that's stored the energy that's there so here's an example burning gasoline the energy is stored in the chemical bonds and then it's converted into kinetic energy our next type of energy the energy of motion so most of chemical energy is potential energy until it does something which is the other big kind of energy is kinetic energy the energy of motion when things are moving so usually back and forth things will convert from one to the other potential to kinetic kinetic to potential you're moving that book from the floor to the table you're using kinetic energy of motion to store the energy potentially in the book and then if you let go it'll stay on the table because the table's in the way if you raise it up and then let it drop it'll make a noise because it's going through the process of converting that information. So you grab a book, you lift it up, you should do this for yourself as well, then drop it. It's going to make a noise because you're converting, once again, that energy back and forth between those two things. So here it talks about an example of steam. Steam at 100 degrees Celsius has more kinetic energy than water because it's moving, it's a gas at 25 degrees Celsius, because they're moving very fast. Remember we said that kinetic energy was the energy of motion. So gases have more kinetic energy than solids, because solids are stuck in that, that crystalline structure. They don't move much. They have a little bit of that Brownian motion, just that slight vibration, but they don't move much. Energy in general can be converted from one thing to another. You can convert mechanical energy, the energy of movement, chemical energy, the energy stored in chemical bonds, electrical energy, the energy of the electron as it moves, heat, the transfer of vibrational energy, nuclear energy, when you split the nucleus or fuse the nucleus, nuclear energy, and in light. We kind of said before when we talked about the matter and what was matter and what was energy at the beginning of class, we talked about several examples. These are several more examples. We talked about that light sometimes works as energy, sometimes it works as matter. So that's one of the few things in nature that has kind of that dualistic nature. Uh, in chemistry, energy is frequently released as heat. And so you have that potential energy, that stored chemical energy that when it goes through the reaction process turns into that heat energy. So in chemistry, most of our reactions that we deal with are the potential energy of the chemical reaction being converted into the heat energy, which is the increase in kinetic energy. Because things move faster as they get heated up. energy transformations. 
the mechanical energy of falling water can be converted into electricity at a hydroelectric plant. So Niagara Falls, at the Hoover Dam, you basically take this huge amount of force that's created by this falling water to spin a turbine to generate electricity in an electric generator that has those magnets pass through that field that pushes the electrons through the wire, pushes electricity. So as the water falls, that high potential energy is converted into kinetic energy, and then it can turn that turbine. So you you're conforming, you're changing, you're transforming one kind of energy into another. And that's how energy works. We use that's how we use energy is through this transformation process. So what happens to the kinetic energy of a particle when a gas is heated? The kinetic energy increases, decreases, remains constant, depends on the gas. So we're taking the kinetic energy, the kinetic the kinetic energy, you remember, is the stored energy. That's the energy, the, the kinetic energy is, the, I'm sorry, the kinetic energy is the energy of motion, the energy of movement. When things move faster, kinetic energy goes up. So when a gas is heated, when you give it more energy, there's more kinetic energy because it's moving more. So kinetic energy is the energy of motion. The more movement, the more kinetic energy. So when we measure energy, just like there are international units for everything else, we have the international unit for length as meter, international unit for mass as gram, the international for unit of time as seconds, we have an international unit for energy as joules. We have a common unit, we use the unit also for heat as calories. So basically 4.18 joules, which is the international unit, can be converted into one small c calorie, one calorie, which is kind of that more common unit. So one calorie or 4.184 joules is the amount of heat needed to change one, the temperature of one gram of water, one degree Celsius. So when you have a gram of water and you put heat into it, to raise it one degree Celsius, that's one calorie, or 4.184 joules. So that's where the definition of a calorie came from, is when you take the standard amount of, the amount of water, one gram, and you heat it to standard temperature, one degree Celsius, that results in standard amount of heat, one calorie. Since calories and joules are very, very small units, we usually talk about kilojoules or kilocalories. So thousands of joules or thousands of calories. And unfortunately, this is where it gets a bit confusing. You have to be very careful about calories and big C calories. So one kilocalorie, a thousand small C calories, is equal to one nutritional big C calorie. So you need to be very, very careful about when you're comparing a small C calorie to a big C calorie. A lowercase calorie to an uppercase calorie. They are not the same. There is a factor of a thousand difference. So make sure when you're looking at tests, when you're looking at problems, when you're looking in the chemistry, that you're being paid very close attention to whether you're looking at small C calories or big C calories. They are substantially different. So let's do some conversions between these. So how many kilojoules, how many thousands of joules of energy are found in 350 calories frozen dinner? So when you look at the label on your frozen dinner, you say, oh, it's 350 calories. That's 350 kilocalories, small three calories. How many joules is that? 
So we take a look back, take a look. Once again, think about our problem solving that we just took, that we just learned about. We read the problem carefully. Now we want to plan our strategy. How are we going to solve this? We're going to take our known 350 kilocalories and convert it into our unknown certain number of kilojoules. We're going to set it up with our conversion process and then do the calculation. And then we're going to check. So here's our solution map. We're going from our known kilocalories to calories because we can do calories to joules and then joules to kilojoules. So that's our steps. We have those three conversions, kilojoules, calories, joules, and kilojoules. So we have those three conversion factors. You know, we have those four steps. Each step has a conversion factor. So then each one of these steps corresponds to a conversion factor. So we start with our known 350 kilocalories. We then start to introduce our conversion factors. Once again, we're going to convert from kilocalories to calories. That's our first step. So we introduce our first conversion factor. Those cancel. We're going to convert from calories to joules. We introduce our second conversion factor. Those cancel. And now we're going to convert from joules to kilojoules. Our last one. And now we do that step. We do the math. We do the calculate step. 350 times 1,000. So 350 times 1,000 times 4.17 times 1 divided by 1 times 1 times 1,000. Do the math, and you get 1,500. So does that make sense? Since a joule is four times larger than a calorie, it makes sense that our answer is four times larger in general than our known is. It's a much bigger answer. Our unknown is much larger than our known, so that makes general sense. So therefore, this makes sense to do it this way. So which of the following terms defines the amount of energy required to raise one gram of water one degree Celsius. So we have our standard amount of water, one gram, and our standard amount of temperature, one degree Celsius. So what's our standard definition of energy? One calorie. We can then equate that to kilojoules, the international standard, but this is our metric standard, it's one calorie, versus the international standard. So one calorie is the amount of energy required to raise one gram of water, one degree Celsius. You need to know that. So now we talk about the difference between heat and temperature. So imagine warming two different sized samples of copper, We're taking them from 25 degrees Celsius up to 100 degrees Celsius. In general, the larger sample will require more heat because there's more stuff. There's more mass. It occupies more space. So it takes more heat to do that. It's the same temperature change, 
But since there's more substance in our second sample, it takes more heat. So temperature is the measure of the intensity of that thermal energy. How hot is the system? And it's, and it's de independent of the amount of copper. Whether you increase 1 gram, 10 grams, 50 grams, 10,000 tons of copper from 25 degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius, the temperature change is independent of that. You're measuring the change in temperature. However, the heat, the amount of heat you need to make that temperature change is dependent directly on how much, how the, qu the quantity of that substance. So that's the difference. Temperature change is the measure of the thermal movement, where heat is the energy it takes to actually do the thing, to do the work. And we talked about before, energy is the ability to do work. In this case, to heat something up. That's heat energy. So then we can talk about the specific heat of something is the amount of energy it needs to take to change the temperature of one gram of a substance, one degree Celsius. So before we talked about that calorie being a standard, now we need to talk about other things other than water. Because with our calorie standard, we talked about water doing that. Now we're going to use the specific heat of something. We're going to use different items. So here we have two blocks that are the same mass, and both are heated to 25 degrees Celsius. And the heat is consistently applied to both of them. The block of copper ends up at a higher temperature than the other block of iron. And the question is, why? Why does one block heat up differently than another? And the answer is copper has a lower specific heat than iron. So less energy is required to change its temperature. Then that's why the block of copper ends up at a higher temperature because if you give them both the same amount of heat, it takes less energy to make that change. So therefore, it has a higher temperature when all is said and done. Because you give it the same heat, it has a different impact. Because copper has a lower specific heat, it takes less energy. So that's one, that's a diff, that's one way, that's a physical property that you can measure that doesn't change the essence of the material. You're testing two metals. You don't know what the metals are. One thing you can do is test their specific heat. Is heat each one of them? For the, we've given them a certain amount of temperature, certain amount of heat, and then determine their final temperatures. That's a measurable quantity that you can use to differentiate one thing from another. So here's the math behind it. The heat that the thing absorbs is the mass times specific heat times the change in temperature. So that delta T, that change in temperature, is the final temperature, T final minus T initial. So wherever it started, you then heated it up. You subtract those two, you get the delta T, the change in temperature. You then can multiply that by the specific heat which is in joules per gram degree Celsius, or depending on which one you use, or, kilo, or calories per gram degree Celsius. They have two examples there, two columns of that. And then they have those specific heats there. So they go through and show you then a comparison of the specific heat of water, which is the universal one that we compare to. And that's our standard. And then we compare it to other things and how they compare to one another. These are all examples of things that have lower specific heats, for example.
So we can use that equation to go through the process of calculating that quantitative change in that material. So let's do an example of that. So here it talks about why does the weather near the coast rarely exhibit extreme hots or colds. The idea there is that the water absorbs, the, you, you near the water, it has a tendency to absorb that heat. Water is a good absorber of heat. It's a good, what they call heat sink. So it takes a while to boil water because it, it absorbs that heat. And then that, that those changes then um, are less impactful on the environment. So water has a tendency to absorb some of those extreme changes. So here's an example. Specific heat iron, 0 0.473 joules per gram degree Celsius. And specific heat lead, 0 0.128 joule per gram degree Celsius. In order to raise the temperature of one gram of these metals by one degree Celsius, Which one of these is true? Both metals require the same amount of energy. Iron requires more than lead. Lead requires more than iron. So pause this for a second. Go back, take a look, and see when we talk about more or less specific heat, which one of those is going to take more or less energy to make that happen. Okay, then you're back. Let's compare your answer. And let's think about this. Since iron has a higher specific heat than lead, iron's going to take more energy to raise the temperature the same amount because it has that greater specific heat can absorb more of that energy. So it's going to take more to get it to the same temperature. So that's what's a takeaway from this particular problem, is that those specific heats tell you, when you compare one to another, how much energy is going to take to get it to the same temperature. Or, if you give it the same amount of energy, then one will get to a higher or lower temperature than the other. If you give these two the exact same amount of energy, then you're, since the lead's lower, you can get to a higher temperature. So let's take a look at going through the calculations of calculating how this actually works. So you want to calculate the heat released as 55 grams of copper with that specific heat cools from 85 degrees Celsius to 22. So you have a hot piece of copper and you set it somewhere, it's going to cool at a certain rate. How much energy is it going to give off as it cools? So you have a hot piece of copper, you put it in water, how much water, uh, you know, how much heat is going to be absorbed by that water? And so different metals are going to do di by different amounts. And this is where you can calculate how much heat is going to come off of there. So you have that heat change. It's going to be the mass, the specific heat, and then the change in temperature. Once again, set this up. You have your known, which is your mass of your solid, multiplied by your specific heat, which is also known, the 0 0.385 joules per gram degree Celsius. And then you have your temperature change, which is your final temperature minus your initial temperature. It's, remember, it's cooling down because it started off hot and it went cooler. So that's why you have to take the 22 minus the 85. Don't switch them. It starts out hotter, it gets colder. Your initial temperature then 
your final temperature is always the first one. Your initial temperature is always the second one. So make sure you're careful with that. Temperature final. Temperature initial. So when things cool down, then that negative value means it lost energy to the surroundings, to the water, whatever it was touching. The energy went from the copper to the thing. So the heat change was negative. So we have a 208 gram sample of the metal. Requires 1.75 kilojoules to change its temperature from 28 degrees, 0.2 degrees Celsius, up to 89 degrees Celsius. What's the specific heat of the metal? So now we're determining specific heat. We have all the measurements. We did the actual measuring of the substance, and now we're determining its specific heat. We're determining that physical change. So we can compare it to a known set of specific heats and then we can determine maybe what this actual metal is based on the specific heat because each metal has its own characteristic one. So the first thing we do is take that given relationship, that heat versus mass, heat equals the mass times specific heat times change in temperature and then we solve it for specific heat because that's our unknown. This is what we're trying to determine is a specific heat. So we have to solve for that. So the easiest way to do that is to solve it here with the words and then plug the numbers in to be able to generate the result. So we have the heat, which is the 1.75 kilojoules. We have to convert that to joules is what you do on top. Kilojoules times joules. On the bottom then, we have the mass, 28 grams, times then the change in temperature. Once again, we have our initial temperature. And we have our final temperature. This time things are heating up, so that'll be a positive number instead of a negative number. So then we have the one seventy five times ten to the third, so times a thousand divided by one. And then that result, 208 minus that product. And that gets you the 1.137 joules per gram degree Celsius, which is the units for specific heat. You have a 59.3 grams of an unknown silvery pure metal was heated to 98.9 .9 degrees Celsius, put into 110.5 grams of water at 24 degrees, 24.3 degrees Celsius. The water was heated by the metal to a temperature of 26.4 degrees Celsius. What's the specific heat of the metal? So this bottom part are our knowns. We know how much metal there was. Okay. 
We know how much water there was. We don't know, or are unknown, is our specific heat of the metal. We know, because we've memorized it, our conversion factor, our specific heat of water. Now we can go through and determine then the change in temperature. So the initial change or the initial temperature of the metal was the 98.9, so that's that initial temperature of the metal. It then cooled to a final temperature so T final minus T initial so the metal and the water together were at that final temperature so that's also the final temperature of the water and then we need to figure out where the water started from that's what we have here is where the water started, the initial temperature of the water. So we had the metal at a temperature and the water at a temperature, put them together, and they came together at a final temperature. So the final temperature for both is the same. They reached a single final temperature. They have different initial temperatures. And you can do that subtraction to come up with the temperature change. So let's take a look then. That's the plan. We understand now how it's, the setup is. We have a metal that was heated. Put it in an amount of water. That was at a certain temperature. That temperature went up. The metal and the water stopped at a certain temperature. Then what's that heat that was exchanged that flowed from the metal into the water? So let's go through the process now of planning that and doing the calculation. So the heat is gained by the water. The heat moved from the metal to the water. So you have the amount of heat, the amount of the mass of the metal, the mass of the amount of the sorry, the, the amount of water, the heat gained by the water. So you have to do the heat gained by the water. So that's the amount of water, the mass of the water, times its specific heat, times its change, then gets you the amount of heat gained by the water. So that's the first step in the process. And you know the amount of heat lost by the solid is the same. Well, the exact opposite, I guess, actually. Heat is lost by the solid. Heat's gained by the water is that negative 970. So you have the heat that went in has to be equal to the heat that left. But they have different signs because that's heat flow. That, that sign tells you the flow of the heat. So the heat flowing into the water is positive. The heat flowing out of the solid is negative. So that's a different that's a thing to remember. That this is heat into water. That's positive. And then here we have heat out of solid and that's negative so it shows the direction of the heat flow is that sign
But then we can use that specific heat formula that we had used before to take that specific heat that flowed out of the solid, put that on top, take the mass of the solid and its change in temperature to then calculate the actual specific heat of the solid. Which is the 0 0.02 grams. So now we have to take a step back. Does it make sense that the specific heat of the solid is less than the specific heat of the water. And in general, we know that that's true. In almost all cases, metals have a lower specific heat than water. They much more readily give up heat than water does. Water is a good heat sink. It sucks in the heat, so it wants to keep it. Metals will get rid of it, so they have a lower specific heat. So that, in general, that answer makes sense, that that specific heat's lower. All right. Let's work through a couple of calculations here. So the specific heat of iron is 0.4. 73 kilojoules uh, joules per gram degree Celsius. How much energy is required to heat up a 40 gram sample of iron from 35 degrees Celsius to 75 degrees Celsius? So if we work through that process, trying to determine the heat, so then we know That in general, heat equals mass times specific heat times change in temperature. So we have our 40 gram sample times specific heat which is 0 0.473 joules per gram degree Celsius times the change in temperature. It went from, so our final temperature is 75 minus 35. Forty grams and grams go. Degree Celsius goes. We're going to be left with joules. This is degree Celsius over here. Times four seven three. Times that's fifty. Five six seven eight. Nope, forty. So then 40 times 40 times 4.4, 0 0.40 is the 757 joules. So for examples of that book, I'll help you work through those. Talk about the generalistic properties of energy, and then uh, we'll be done for the day. So in general, energy is in chemical changes. In all chemical changes, matter is either absorbed or releases energy. So when it goes through a chemical change, it either takes it in, 
and gets colder or releases it and it feels warm when the chemical reaction occurs. Chemical reactions can be used to produce different kinds of energy. So when we burn wood to get heat and light. Chemical reactions in a car battery produce electricity. So you can use that potential energy stored in the chemical reaction and in the chemical bonds to create different kinds of energy. Chemical changes often produce energy. Here you see an example, a great example of a chemical change going on. You have the liquid rocket fuel. I think the solid boosters are actually going on here, but you also have the liquid fuel in the center. So you have hydrogen gas, liquefied hydrogen, plus liquefied oxygen, giving you water vapor. So this is all water vapor on the bottom, plus lots of fire. So you get lots of heat out. You can see that down there. Energy and chemical changes. Energy can be used to cause chemical reactions. Photosynthesis. Light comes in. The energy, light energy comes in and helps plants break up large molecules into smaller molecules to be used for nutritional purposes. Electrolysis, splitting that water to create those gases. So which of the following processes releases energy? Walking, gasoline burning in a car engine, dehydrating grapes to make raisins, blowing up a balloon. So if a release of energy, when that gasoline is burned and turned into carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, uh, sulfur dioxide, so all those things, that conversion process releases energy. You consume energy, you take in energy to walk. Take in energy to get the water out of the grapes. Putting up a balloon takes in energy. So you have the release of energy in the combustion. Just like we had a conservation of matter, we also have a conservation of energy. So energy can be neither created nor destroyed. It can only be transformed in one to one form or another. So on this particular graph, we have a graph of potential energy going up. So we have to put energy into the system. We have to put in energy to break the water. So we put in energy to break this water. So we have those water molecules, we have to break them apart. They'd rather be together, but we break them apart. So we have to increase that potential energy to put that at a higher state, put it into the gas. So once that's stored, basically we're storing the energy. We can convert that electrical energy into chemical energy by converting it into gases. And we can store the energy in those gases. And then at a later date, if we want to get that energy back out again, then we can give those gases a small amount, just a teeny little bit of energy to start
start the reaction, and then it will then automatically go to completion. Put a spark in that oxygen and, and water, the uh, oxygen and hydrogen combination of those gases, it's a teeny spark, and boom, it becomes water, and it gives off a lot of energy in the process. So energy in, and then energy back out again, converting between different kinds of energy. But the total amount of energy is conserved. All the energy you put in to break it, you get back out again when you form the water molecules again. So it's not, energy is not destroyed, it's not created, it's just transformed. So changes to a system that require energy have a positive energy value, meaning the system gains energy. Changes to the system that release energy have a negative value, so energy is lost from the process, from the system. So when you burn paper, it would have a negative energy because the system loses energy as heat. You burn the paper, things get hot, the energy loses the system, leaves the system. So it's a negative energy value. Boiling water would have a positive energy value because the system has to gain energy to change from a liquid to a gas. So it's a positive energy value. because That system gains the energy to use it to overcome that barrier in states, to change states. Your turn. So which of the following processes results in a system losing energy and having a negative energy value? Arctic ice melting, dry ice subliming, changing from the solid to the vapor, starting a car, dynamite exploding. Pause, take a moment, think about those four, jot down what you think the answer is, then come back. So dynamite exploding is a change, chemical change, that changes that potential energy in the chemical bonds of dynamite and explodes out into kinetic energy. That system lost energy as it transferred the energy and the heat to the overall environment. It exploded, fireball, sound, moving pieces of shrapnel, and that kinetic energy. So that's a negative energy value. Another example. Which of the following physical changes does not require energy to take place? Evaporation, going from a liquid to a gas. Melting, going from the solid to the liquid. Condensing, going from the gas to a liquid. Sublimation, going from the solid directly to the gas. Take a moment, pause, think about it, shut down your answer, and then start up again. So condensation, because you're changing that physical state from the higher energy state of gas to the lower energy state of liquid doesn't take energy put into the system to do that. So it doesn't require energy put into the system. It will occur naturally because liquid water is that lower energy state. 
So if given no other options, it will just happen. You have to put energy into the system to keep it a gas. If there's no extra energy there, if you're not putting energy into the system, it condenses. So it doesn't require energy to condense, it just happens. So let's look at energy in the real world. You have chemical reactions in the sun that produce heat and light that our planet needs to survive. So having those reactions in the sun produces tremendous amounts of energy that hits us. Plants then use that heat and light through the process of photosynthesis to store that energy that came from the sun. They convert those simple sugars into more complex sugars that they can use later. Plants decay and eventually produce fossil fuels over millions of years. Oil, lots of pressure, lots of temperature under that certain conditions will produce those fossil fuels. And then we can then burn those fossil fuels later to do the work. So that's a long, drawn-out process of getting that sunlight into our gas tank. But that's what we do. We use these conversion steps to convert the main energy we have in our universe, in our solar system, light and heat, into other forms that we can use. In this case, the potential energy, the chemical energy in gasoline fossil fuels. So here's some of the products of petroleum, the hydrocarbons. Natural gas is a mixture of methane and propane, a little bit of butane. So when you're looking at using the natural gas in your stove, if you use a, a gas stove, you have a mixture of those gases. And then the higher up you get, so methane, uh, ethane, propane, butane, those are all gases. As you get higher and higher, those become liquids. And the higher you go, the more complex the, the, the hydrocarbon, the closer it is to uh, liquid fuels that we use. Coal, which is basically carbon, provides 20% of the United States energy needs talks about two major energy sources that we use. Petroleum, which is a hydrocarbon, and this pure carbon, which is coal. Not pure carbon, but close to pure carbon. Thinking about other solutions, other things we use, we can convert between different energy sources. You have wind, where we're converting that kinetic energy of the wind into electrical energy, and then sometimes you store it in a battery, and chemical energy, so you have several transformations there. We have photovoltaics, where you're converting that light directly into electricity by those semiconductors, and then you can store that. And then the energy of biomass. So you have grasses, plants, and they go through that process we covered before of taking light and heat through photosynthesis and turning it into carb complex uh, carbohydrates and sugars that either we use or we have animals eat and then we eat the animals. So according to the law of conservation of energy, energy can be created, can be destroyed, can be created and destroyed, or can be converted from one form to another. It can only be converted from one form to another. You cannot create energy, you cannot destroy it, you can just convert it from one to another. So make sure you do the practice problems. Take a look at those problems. If you have questions, please make sure, make sure you come in during office hours, during some time, if we have extra time after lab or after the tests, etc. See if you have any questions. Because it is complicated, that whole heat energy with the calculations of specific heat and joules and heat from those 
are complicated equations, and you need to cut, and you need to practice those. So make sure you spend some time doing that. That's the end of the chapter four lecture recording. Thanks.